Hey guys, welcome to the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. And one of my absolute favorite ways of doing that is doing sermon reviews. And in case you're new here and you don't know what a sermon review is, we work through a variety of different sermons from a variety of different pastors, sometimes suggested by you and sometimes uh, just ones that I found interesting and I wanted full context for. So today we are going to be doing that. It is going to be a long one. Now, full disclosure, I have not seen any of this sermon except the viral clip that many of you have probably seen with this particular pastor using a baseball bat with the Bible attached to it, smashing a dollhouse as some sort of illustration. Now, this entire sermon, and the reason a lot of people won't watch this whole thing, is because it's an hour long. Just the sermon. Just the sermon. So if you want to... <clears throat> Uh, check out that full sermon without my commentary. That link, as always, will be in the uh, links below, as well be some uh, links to support what we're doing here on the channel through Patreon and other means, as well as a free downloadable PDF sermon review guide that you can use at your church or while you watch sermons like this. But when we watch sermons like this, we ask three specific questions. One, do they read the text? Secondly, do they use context and culture to bring out the application and exegete the text correctly? And three, do they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Sometimes we hit that bar. Sometimes we really, we don't even get close. Today, I have no clue where we'll be. We have done a Greg Locke sermon review before. Um, was not impressed, but I did find out he's got quite a following of people that love him a lot. And if you say things that are not in line with their thinking of him, they don't like you. So today we're going to do another one. And the only reason I'm doing this is because that viral clip of Greg Locke with the Bible duct tape and zip tied to a bat in which he bashes the dollhouse as some sort of representation of using the sword to break down demonic strongholds. I just would like the full context of that. That just doesn't make sense at all. So we're going to watch it. Yeah, we're going to watch it. If you don't uh, have time to watch the whole thing, one of those links below will be the audio podcast. So you'll get to hear all the, the, the at least the, the audio, maybe not the visuals. So let's hop over to the review screen. Here is Pastor Greg Locke. Getting ready into it. I don't want to really drain too much of this time because this is going to be a long one anyway. So that being said, let's get to it. You can head back to your seat. Our students are staying in with us tonight. Pastor Jesse wanted them and as well as himself to hear the uh, principle that I want to share tonight. So we'll have our students stay in. And so maybe I'm not as... Uh, animated as Pastor Jesse in that room, but I think the kids will be able to handle it. Amen. Matthew chapter 12 is where I want to invite your attention for our text tonight. Um, okay, as always, I know we're jumping in really soon. Matthew chapter 12 is where you're going to want to turn. Um, let me see, Matthew chapter 12. The reason we do this is so that we can see the context of what he is talking about um, and if it is in within context of everything that's happening. So Matthew chapter 12, it looks like probably just because I know he's talking about strongholds and demonic strongholds because of the clip. It's probably going to be my guess is verse starting at verse 43, probably in chapter 12. But we'll see what he says. So let's get to it. I'm well aware of the fact that that is not our Ephesians series. If you saw my Facebook post, we are purposely by way of Holy Spirit leadership diverting from that. We'll be back a couple of weeks ago. I made the announcement just really in passing, the statement in passing that the Lord had been downloading some things in my heart, not just about deliverance ministry. We do a lot of that. We see a lot of that around here. But it's interesting wording, downloading things. I mean, it could just be modern language. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe uh, something whereby we needed to right the ship in a few areas because if you're not careful, you can take a very biblical concept and have an imbalance and eventually go far away from a biblical concept. Does that make sense? And so you have to stay balanced in the truth and in the nature of the word of the Lord. And so that's what I want to do tonight. I'm not, I'm not preaching. So that's interesting. Okay, so his whole concept is that you have to be careful to stay balanced with scripture, not taking one concept and running just rampant with it. Now, I, I say that, <laughs> it's a bit ironic that he says that, um, and I and we'll see how this sermon pans out. Again, I haven't watched it. 
I've sort of kept up with Greg Locke. I know he's very much into deliverance ministries now. That is not how he used to be. Uh, used to, he was very political. Uh, he still may be political, but I know it's very like deliverance, demon, you know, possession stuff now for him. So he seems to jump. Uh, he should, seems to have jumped the ship on the politics thing being his primary thing. And now he's into demon possession and exorcism. Well, not exorcisms, but basically. Um, Greg Locke's an interesting character. Let's just say that. So for him to say you don't take one thing and run with it, I find that <laughs> to be ironic. We'll see how he does it, though, with this, right? We'll see, we'll see what he says. But it's the concept is right. Right, you don't want to make an entire, um, you don't want to make an entire doctrine off of one or two verses. Like you, all of Scripture needs to speak to this. So that statement is true. I just find it ironic from the person it's coming from. Anything new? You have to be careful about people that are all the time looking for something new. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. If it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. Now it may be new to us, but it's always been there. I've heard pastors and evangelists and missionaries and preachers say oftentimes, I'm going to preach something that no one's ever preached on before. That's dangerous. I mean, even the gospel was preached by Abraham in the Old Testament, the Bible says. And so there's nothing new under the sun. I'm not going to give you anything that's not already been in the context and in the confines of Scripture. I just want to bring it out in a way that perhaps we've never brought it out, or at least we haven't in our church, because... We're new to this. We're just a couple of years in. We're trying to unpackage some things. We're still... So a couple of things. Not that this matters. All right. I just want to make sure that I say that out front. For those that are listening, I'll explain it to you. <clears throat> the size of a church is not representative of the um, uh, gospel authority of the pastor, right? There's tiny churches led by really faithful men, and there's huge churches ran by not faithful and vice versa. It does look like he's lost some people from his tent though. So that's interesting that there aren't, doesn't seem to be as many people there. Again, not an important thing, but that, it, that struck me. Usually the things I've seen in the past are really, really full. Anyway, secondly, it's very interesting how he's sort of um, building himself a structure of safety. So he says, you know, we don't want to build off a doctrine off of something uh, of one or two verses. Uh, and we definitely don't want to hear When you hear a pastor say that it's, this is a brand new thing you need to run. But this may sound like a brand new thing I'm telling you about, but it's not. It's always been around. So though it may sound like a brand new thing, it's not a brand new thing because you should definitely run from the brand new thing. And so he's sort of insulating himself um, here from being like, what you hear is going to sound weird. It's not new, though. It's always been taught. But you should definitely watch out for the stuff that is new that's not you've never heard before. It's just... I don't think gaslighting is the term for it, but it's, it's, he's definitely building himself like a protective structure of what you hear is new, but it's not new, new, like the other new, new stuff that you shouldn't listen to. This is new stuff that you should listen to. We're trying to figure out what we're unloading off the U-Haul, right? And so we want to be right. We want to be balanced. We want to be biblical. And uh, you, you know it's going to be fun at church when the preacher's got props. Amen. That is not a parakeet underneath that <laughs> cover there. So I, I need you to go to Matthew 12. We're going to be a couple of different places tonight. We're just going to take it as the Holy Spirit gives it to us. I'm not going to rev things up and take off fast. i got a lot to say. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to temper myself. I'm going to pace myself because I want to be thorough and I want to be theological tonight, okay? And so it would do you well to jot some things down in your Bible or on the back of your hand or your neighbor's blue jeans or something, right? Just write some things down tonight because I promise you it'll be, it'll be helpful. It'll be worthwhile in our journey together as we talk about the authority and the power that we have over unclean spirits and we have that demonstratively definitively but i, I want to fix a bit of what i am considering a theological wives tale a deliverance fable that has scared a lot of people away from deliverance ministry and i've heard many people say oh i, I don't want to go through deliverance because and then they're going to fill in the blank with the deal that we're going to develop tonight from the word of the Lord. And so if you have your Bibles open there to Matthew chapter 12, would you shout amen? amen. Let's Perhaps they don't want to go through deliverance ministry because we don't really see it in the Bible. Now, I know I, I'm sure someone will comment about this. I am not the professional 
uh, uh, on deliverance ministry. In fact, I've, I've barely seen the deliverance ministry people on my timeline, but when I do see them, I go, Hmm, that's strange. You don't see that a lot. That's not something that's, uh, the, the, the apostles in Jesus are not going out casting demons from every random person that they find because everyone has a demon. Um, so that's weird. You also don't see demons manifesting as they usually talk about uh, in these uh, these uh, these uh, deliverance ministry videos. Like you mentioned devil and it starts going ah! like you don't really read about that uh, in scripture so much. I don't we don't I, I see no examples. I mean, please put them in the comment section if, if you do. Let's pray. Father, tonight. I ask that with everything in my heart and mind and all the stuff stirring around that I want to say, that I would really only say that which the Holy Ghost leads me to. Lord, help all of my friends in-house and online that are watching now, that will watch later, because many people are going to go back and be very interested in this theological unpackaging, this concept, Lord. So tonight, I pray that you'd help me to, to measure my words Help me to be right in what I say. Help me to be biblical in the context and the narrative of Scripture. So, Lord, be honored in everything that is said and done over the course of these moments. And I pray that nights like tonight would not diminish but only increase the authority that we have in the good things of God through the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, bless our church tonight in just an unbelievable way. And Lord, keep distractions to a minimal that we can focus by faith on the power and the influence of this book we call the Bible. In the name of Jesus and the church, shout it out. In Matthew chapter 12, you have the context of Jesus talking about the unpardonable sin. We've dealt with that on a number of occasions. I did an entire live on that just about a month and a half ago. And we know that when Jesus talked about the unpardonable sin, he was referring to the fact that you can blaspheme God the Father, you can blaspheme God the Son, but you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit and expect to have forgiveness in this life or in the life to come. Because if you look at something that the Holy Spirit is doing through someone, but you attribute it rather to an evil spirit, you are saying that the Holy Spirit is an evil spirit, and the Bible says that God's Spirit will not forgive you for that. And so that's a short way around the barn to say you better be careful that you don't try to destroy the work of God and make yourself look spiritual in doing so because the Bible says in that day, in that day, you shall know them by their fruits. The way you can know as to someone is false or not is not by what they wear, not how loud or how, qui how quiet, not the denominational tag that they have, not the identification of the way that they sing songs, not are they red, yellow, black, white, tall, short, fat, skinny. You can look at their fruit. The fruit is the fundamental fact as to whether they are true or not. What are they producing in people's lives? Okay, so yeah. Yeah, there is fruit um, that can be produced. I think that what strikes me automatically when I hear that is, okay, but what about the, the things that they're teaching? Because there's lots of people that teach things that are contrary to Scripture, but have outcomes that look favorable, right? So there are people that just teach bad doctrine, but they have churches that give millions of dollars away to the community. So that millions of dollars to the community seems like a positive fruit, but they got it through teaching, you know, perverse, twisted doctrines on giving and prosperity. I mean, as one example. So, yeah, the fruit is an example, but we have a list of what those fruits are. Um, and so you can't just say, hey, look at the fruit of the ministry, right? Um, I mean, that was one of the reasons um, I think it was also mentioned in the Mars Hill sort of um, that podcast that like all of the bad things that were being done were reasoned away by saying, yeah, but look at all the fruit we have. So yes and no, like the, you will know them by their fruits, but we also have a list of the fruits of the spirit. And so you got to weigh those, you know, against one another and just say, just because some good thing is happening or it's, it's, it's exploding and it's really big and a lot of people are coming, you can easily say, look at that fruit, look at the positivity of that. But if it's backed up by negative things that don't line up with scripture, so I would just be super cautious by saying, oh, we're just doing it because of the fruit. Like we're just, we're going to weigh everything on that because that is equally as dangerous. 
That's how you know. And so you got to be careful not to look at someone that's flowing in the evidence of the Holy Spirit and say, well, I don't understand it, therefore it must not be of God. Let me tell you where I'm at in my life. I'm to a place now where I would rather, rather say, you know what, I don't understand it. Let me talk to that person. Let me figure it out. Then just blow their face off and make them be considered ungodly or wicked or at best a witch doctor. So I'm careful. All right, I, I've, had to, I've had to measure myself a little bit. I've had to repent in some areas, both privately and publicly. I've, I've called people out from this pulpit, even those that maybe to this moment, theologically, we're worlds apart. Okay, we're worlds apart. But there's been a time that I thought it spiritual to call people out because of something that someone told me about them when I did not have the actual verified facts myself. That's dangerous. That's sinning against the brethren. That's not a bad point. That's, that's a good point. I just did a whole interview the other day on, on Charisma. And they'll, they'll be putting the thing out basically of, of me really having to eat crow. It's, it's crazy that the guy that used to carry the sword is now building bridges to the people that he used to chop their heads off with, right? Now look, I'm not talking about, I don't care if you clap or not, I'm not talking about compromising truth. I'm as straight as they come. Gun barrel straight and full of the gospel Gatlin gun, praise God, when it comes to the Bible. But I've got to a place now where I'm trying to go back and recross a bridge that I should have never burned down to begin with. Does that make sense? And I don't need another place to preach. And I don't charge money when I preach, and so I don't need their checks. I don't care, right? I'm trying to build the kingdom. I'm not trying to build a portfolio and a, and a, and a phone number list. I got enough people in my phone already, praise God, all right? Some of them I probably need to delete and get rid of and not even call anymore. But all of that to say, I'm finding myself much more measured by the Holy Spirit, not coming out half-cocked with just a, a few arguments that sound cute and sound King James and then just blow somebody's face off. And you know one of the reasons, and I'm getting to my preaching, okay, and I'm not going to go into all the details tonight, but you know one of the reasons that I have now got to a place where I feel that way? Because when I look online, I say to myself, no wonder people hate me. Everybody okay? Somebody needs to drink some coffee up in this house. I'm ready to preach. This ain't he says, I don't care if you're clap or not, but now he's getting on to them for not clapping. St. Mary's Catholic Church, it's Global Vision. Wake up. Jason Boggs in the house. Somebody get excited, amen. When I look at YouTube, I think, no wonder people hate our church. The 30, 60, 90 second out of context clips. Well, hey, look at that. That's why we're doing this. So we can get the whole context of him bashing a dollhouse with a Bible. I mean, that's why we're doing this. That have no flow to them whatsoever. And I think to myself, man, no wonder the people that have never actually ever been here or ever met me, no wonder they can't stand me. If that's all I had, I wouldn't be able to stand me either. And so what's causing me now... That's quite self... I mean, that's a self-reflection there. That's not bad. ...to be pausal in how I come out hot against other people that sometimes I really want to come out hot against and sometimes I have is the fact that I know now how it feels for people to take me out of context and try to paint a picture to the entire world that's not at all true about my life or about the context and narrative of our church. Does that make sense? And so I'm, I'm in a whole thing right now you, you, with, you know, my friends and, you know, blah, 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 blah whatever. And I'm going to tell you something about, about friendship with Greg Locke. I am loyal to my friends, no matter which side of the aisle they're on. And so now it's almost, can I just talk, Hillbilly? Uh, <sighs> I wish I would have watched this a little before because we're 10 minutes in and we've not covered anything substantial. He's just rambling at this point. Like, I, I appreciate the self-reflection. Um, I'm kind of wondering what any of this has to do, though, with Matthew chapter 12 uh, at all. It's almost like evangelical Christianity has become a peeing contest. Everybody okay? 
I'm not trying to out-preach anybody. I'm not trying to out-prophesy anybody. I'm not trying to out-build anybody. I'm not trying to out-dress anybody, nothing. And so I'm, I'm to a place in my life where I, I feel like maybe I have been in need of slowing down and getting some better facts before I come off half-cocked and just sound bold and Greg Locke-like and just blow people's face off because I can. Just because you can don't always mean that you should. It just sounds like to me that it's the principle that we see Paul talking about, like not somebody shouldn't become an elder in their new to the faith, right? Like there's maturity that happens. Like the, the whole, one of the whole th purposes that new believers don't become elders or pastors is for the exact reason he's talking about. I mean, there's the same thing with Mark Driscoll uh, as another example. Like you don't just get saved and then go plant a church. It's just not a smart idea. Now I'm getting there. You know, I wrote an entire book. Now, this is in my independent Baptist days, and so I can give myself a little bit of grace because I was a jerk. I wrote an entire book against a guy who I'd never been on the phone with one day in my life. Wrote a six-chapter book against a guy I'd never even called his office to see if I could get an audience with him. Now, that's a long time ago, and in grace... I'm sure he's seen the book and he's forgiven me because in a couple of weeks we're actually having a, a, a sit-down meeting. And it's not that we're going to, you know, sing Kubaya and smoke cigars. I'm not going on an apology tour, right? There's some people I've called out before that are nothing but fake, phony, false prophets. I get it. But I've been known to lump in maybe some people that I should have never lumped in just because they were friends with those people and so look I can like you and not like your friends right you can like me and not like everybody I run with I got some good pastor friends I can't stand their wife but I love my pastor friend and I would never disrespect the wife so don't ask me who it is but it's not like I'm gonna call my friend and say you know what I was supposed to preach for you in a couple of months but I'm not going to because you know, your wife just talks too much no, I don't have to like his kids and his wife. I don't have to like his dog. He's my friend. And so all of that to say, there's a lot of drama going on in Christianity right now. And I'm just asking our church, don't get caught up in it. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who's a demon slayer? Who's a witch doctor? Who's a warlock? Who's a this? Who's a that? Who's a this? Who's a that? God's going to sort the whole thing out. And the Bible's going to still be true at the end of the day. Right? So uh, I wasn't planning on saying any of that, and so I, I don't even really want to. I, I, I don't want to keep talking about it, but it, it, it fit the narrative of the introduction. And that was just introduction. Please don't time me yet. We have not started. Because these religious people were looking at Jesus and saying, we don't understand your methodology, therefore you are wrong. And we have judged far too many people by the methodology that they use rather than the message that they proclaim. There you go. That sums up the sermon reviews, guys. I could care less about methodology. The whole point is, do they use the scripture in the correct way? Do they use, do they read the chunks of scripture that are coherent together, all together, and do they exegete them using context and culture to bring an application? So, so far, sounds like his approach is okay in regards to methodology. Like, who cares what your methodology is? I mean, there are obviously parameters here, but in general, your methodology and presentation style are not going to be totally terrible. The, the, the irony of this is that I know that in not too long, I mean, I don't have, I have a clue how far into this, but at some point during this sermon, he's going to bring out a Bible duct taped to a bat. <laughs> and so I go, I don't want to judge your methodology, but bro, like what? So let's, let's keep going. And sometimes people's methodology is different. We get preachers in the house. Your methods are not my methods. My methods are not your methods. Can you imagine if people in the Bible didn't have enough sense but to come off just half angry and start disqualifying other things and other ways that God spoke because it wasn't the way that they spoke? It wasn't the way God did it with them? I mean, think about Elijah. The Bible says that in Elijah's life, God spoke to him one demonstrative way in a still, small voice. 
Because the Bible says that God was not in the fire, in the whirlwind, or in the earthquake. It doesn't mean that God never speaks those ways. It means in Elijah's life, that's not how God revealed himself, right? So what if Elijah would have said, God only speaks in a still small voice. He never speaks in the fire. He never speaks in the earthquake. And he never speaks in the whirlwind. You know what he would have done? He would have thrown Job under the bus because Job did not get spoken to by God in a still small voice. He was spoken to by God out of a whirlwind. So just because God didn't speak to Elijah the same way that he spoke to Job did not make either Job or Elijah false. Am I making sense? So we got to be careful. I've sinned against people in this pulpit at the expense of trying to be bold. You know, this isn't bad. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. That what he's given here, I mean, even though it is rambling, even though it's not at all part of the sermon, this is basically just giving commentary on Greg Locke's essential repentance, I suppose, in regards to what he said from the pulpit. But what he's saying isn't bad. Like, he's right. There are people all the time that make um, purposeful remarks in order to, uh, like, make a hot take. And then they'll, you know, they'll do their hot take and they'll get their 15 minutes and then they'll just keep doing it because we all know that controversy sells. And so that's what people will keep doing. Everybody online knows this too, by the way. If I post a reel about a certain pastor, uh, it'll blow up. And if I post a uh, the new format where we put the you know the scripture down and we break the scripture down, the scripture breakdowns can get considerably less views. Why? Because that's not as interesting. That's not as hot of a take. That's not going after nobody. And so we've already pre-programmed ourselves to to want hot takes, and the algorithm feeds off of that. So I mean, what he's doing here. I got to give Greg Locke some props in regards to at least what he's saying. We'll see how it fits out in the whole sermon. But his introduction in apologizing for going after people that he should have never went after, apologizing for making huge assumptions about people without ever meeting them. This isn't bad. I mean, this isn't, I mean, altogether, just by itself, this isn't bad advice. This is pretty, pretty reasonable. Hmm. We okay? I don't know what y'all expecting tonight. Good grief. Y'all like sitting there like, mm. See, I think the part of the reason is they're sitting there like, mm, because that's why they came, right? When you build a brand on crazy, like, ah, that's why people are there. When you build a brand on calling people out all the time, that's all people want to see. If you build a brand on, um, uh, you know, ragging on the church all the time, that's all people want to see. If you build a brand on uh, anything, like if, if your thing is X, Y, Z and you go off X, Y, Z, you lose the people that are there because that's why they're there. Now, I don't know if that's why everybody's there, but if you've been known for the bold Greg Locke preaching and you're not bold Greg Locke preaching, people will think that you've sold out to something else. Um, it's just the truth. I mean, if you, I can name a five accounts off the top of my head, which I'm not going to, but if they change their format at all, <laughs> they lose so many people and then it it, tra it keeps them trapped in this um this this cycle of having to post the same stuff and constantly having to outdo themselves and uh, i've been on the verge of doing that before and that's why i change i've changed up my my whole thing a couple of times that's why we do good and bad sermons on here that's why uh we, we the video essays we're doing on this channel there's going to be a couple really good ones as well because it, you you need to see like, oh, there's a lot more to this than just this one thing. Um, it's just, you can get so trapped by numbers that um, you try to outdo yourself all the time and outbold yourself. And that's who you, that's what your audience wants and that's why they're there and you switch it up. Um, and I think that's what he's kind of, nobody's amening because he's just being honest and repenting. And that's not what they're used to. Mm. I, I know we're not used to preachers apologizing. It's, it, it's especially like, Cutthroat guys, right? I mean, I used to walk around with a grenade in my pocket, just walk, bam! And God's like, mm, stick the pen back in, son, just wait. I'll tell you who to blow up. And when you do, blow him up. I was talking to Wayne about this yesterday. 
And he made a, a great observation. Look, when a guy becomes a peacemaker that's been known as a war starter, right? Because I've been to a place, I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm not trying to build a ministry. I'm trying to build the kingdom. I'm not trying to build a name for myself. Good grief, Google me. That's run already. Right? But you know what happens to a guy like me that has a heart change? Look out for the people that he does call out. Right? Because if you're willing to, to mend the gap with some people that you have some major differences with, look out when the name does roll off my tongue. Because I've done my research at that point. And it's not that I'm happy-go-lucky, skip to maloo my darling with everybody that I've ever called out. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in, I'm learning to mature and measure myself a little bit because I've come out loud because you amen me. Because the internet clapped. But I had to grow out of being a tap dancing monkey. What in the world? That is, that's great. I mean, that's exactly what I just said. The dude, he did it because he got a lot of applause for it. And he got a lot of, he got a lot of nor, 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 notoriety for it. He, he apparently has recognized that. And he's tired of being quote unquote a dancing monkey. I'm telling you what, I came to this review expecting uh, Greg Locke with a Bible bashing a dollhouse uh, with it. And uh, I, the first 17 minutes here have been fairly refreshing. Right? If you're going to have a prophetic voice, you got to prophesy the right way. you got to prophesy the right way. Am I making sense tonight? So these Pharisees... Who in the world got a hold of him? I, I suppose don't... I am hashtag a recovering Pharisee. Don't put your lip at you are too. Some of you are not even recovering, praise God. I saw them comments about my shirt last week. Golly! You kidding me? Good grief. Ezekiel preached buck naked. I ain't pulled that one off on a Wednesday night yet. Oh, uh, that may be why it's less people. This may be Wednesday night. Maybe that's that's why. He had glitter and gold in his shirt. Oh dear God, he's a false prophet. Ezekiel's over here like. Huh? <laughs> but anyhow. So Jesus is looking at these Pharisees, these religious people, and he's like, you be careful. You measure your words wisely. Just because you don't understand something or someone does not automatically discount it as false. Does that make sense? So he just dealt with that. Now notice, please, verse 43 is where we're going to pick up. Because how many of us know that when you get involved heavily in deliverance ministry, as we are, very tip of the spear, very well known for deliverance ministry, and I'm grateful for that. Movies, books, the whole deal. People come here all the time. 72 straight Sunday nights. We know the whole rigmarole, right? We don't bemoan it. We thank God for it. But here's a principle that we got to be careful with because I've heard people say, well, you know, I don't want to go through deliverance because you know the Bible says once you go through deliverance, they might come back and be seven times worse. And why would I want to subject myself to that? We hear that all the time. All the time. And let's be honest. We've told people because we didn't know, right? We were a little weak sauce in the way we did things. We got baptized into this quick and nobody really preaches on this. And so we're like, well, you know, the Bible says in Matthew chapter number 12, you got to be careful because when that demon comes back, he's going to bring seven more. No wonder you can't get free. No wonder you got to keep coming to 72 different, you know, services on Sunday night. No wonder, no wonder, no wonder. Not everything is a demon. And the principle of returning demon into the house from which it left has been used as a spectacular moment in deliverance ministry that I'm convinced keeps more people bound than set free. Now, what I'm not going to do is theologically try to discourse. Is he talking about saved people, talking about lost people? Look, we do not make a habit out of casting demons out of lost people. Of course, they're going to come back. If they are not saved through repentance and faith in the gospel and have their lives submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ, then it is more dangerous to be casting demons out of somebody that is lost than it is just to get them saved and then deal with them from a deliverance standpoint. Okay, so I'm not going to argue Christians, non-Christians, demons, non-demons. Okay, I'm going to talk to you from this principle on how we've missed this. 
Okay, so this is probably where I'm coming in a little weak on the conversation because, again, as I've said, I don't know anything about deliverance ministry. I'm not a subject matter expert on it. I have no clue. All I'm approaching that is from Scripture and where we're at. Now, I think it is important because I don't know where he's going with this, but it is important to note sort of within the flow of thought of what Matthew is saying. So um, he did... Greg Locke uh, talked about how he had preached a sermon at some point, I don't know how recently, on blaspheme uh, against the Holy Spirit, which is in the same chapter, verses 22 through uh, about 32. Uh, then we go to the the tree is known by its fruits, which is what he was sort of alluding to before, uh, as far as how you can know, you know, the legitimacy of something. Uh, we got 33 through uh, 37 on that. And then we have a sign of Jonah. Uh, now, this is a whole, like, sort of... Matthew writes it sort of as a sort of continuity of timeline. And so in verse 38, it says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to them except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up against, uh, rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented of the, at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And the queen of the South will rise up in judgment for this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit has gone out from a person, it passes through water as places. Now, so this, that's the breakdown. That's what I want to kind of show you there. We go into the sign of Jonah and then we seem to go, right into this teaching about when the unclean spirit has gone out from a person. So sort of keep flow of thought there. Uh, One of those places uh, is seeking rest and finds none. Then it says, I will return to the house from which it came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept and put together in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last statement, I'm sorry, the last state of the person is worse than the first. So also will be this evil generation. Now, Mind you, we have some clues here. He's talking about, so will it be with this evil generation. He's previously, uh, in verses 38 through 37, talked about the, um, the, the men of Nineveh rising up and the queen of the south rising up, both testifying and condemning this generation. Um, so there's, there's connection here between 38 uh, and what we see here in verse 45. Then it goes on to say, when he was still speaking to the people, so... This seems to confirm the flow of thought. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, uh, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. And he replied to the men who told him, who is my brother and who is, uh, who is my mother and who is my brother. So we're going to go on off on something else. So the idea here is that the scribes and Pharisees, within the context of this verse we're talking about, and I'm just saying all of this before we get to anything he says, just so I, I don't want that to influence what I'm saying. Right. So I just want to see the context before he gets to it. Uh, Scribes and Pharisees come up and they want to see a sign. Christ says to them, you're not going to, uh, the sign you will see is the sign of the prophet Jonah. He was in the belly of the uh, fish for three days and three nights. The son of man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And then he switches to, but the men of Nineveh are going to condemn you in this generation because, you know, you have something greater uh, than Jonah here preaching to you. And also the queen of the South is going to rise up in judgment of this generation and condemn it because she sought out wisdom and something, somebody more wise than Solomon is here. And then he goes into something apparently that he would under, they would understand is connecting to what he's talking about and talks about unclean spirits. It was uh, at least, I don't know if I want to say overly common, but it was something that they did, which was cast out unclean spirits. Um, the Pharisees did and Sadducees. And so he uses this example, apparently, in, in tying together this thought and says, when an unclean spirit has gone out for a person and passes through waterless places, it find uh, places seeking rest, but it finds none. It says, I will return to the house in which I came. And when it comes, it finds an empty house swept in order. It then goes and brings seven more spirits, more evil than itself, to enter and dwell. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. So now they are worse off than they were before. And he says, so also will it be with this generation. They will be worse off now than they were before, even though um, they have had, you know, somebody greater than Jonah preaching, wisdom greater than Solomon preaching. They're going to be worse off 
now than there were before because Jesus has come. They've had the evidence of not only that he, he's in the tomb for three days and three nights and has risen, but he's also preached to them. He's also given them wisdom. And now they've denied all of it. And they're going to be worse off now than they were before because they've had the opportunity. They didn't take the opportunity, which is the exact reason why the men of Nineveh and the queen of the South will condemn them in the end because they had a better opportunity than they even had. And even with the lesser opportunity, they repented. Or at least in, in the case of the queen of the South, she took Solomon's wisdom and advice. And Jesus ties this all together. So contextually, this is where we're at in verse 43. It has very little to do with demon possession, and it is much more being used as an example by Jesus to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or in the scribes and the Pharisees, rather, in order to communicate a point to them about their state and what they're doing in denying him than it has anything to do about principles and theologies and doctrines on demon possession. Let's be really clear on that before we go any further. This is, this is an example that Jesus is using for them in a way that apparently they would understand to communicate his point. If you read it in context, that's what we're talking about. Now, with that knowledge, let's get into what Greg Locke is talking about. And guys, I get it. This is a long sermon review. We're already 40 minutes in. We're only 20 minutes into his sermon. It's an hour-long sermon. Buckle in. This is going to be a minute. Because what you're going to find out is he is not talking about someone that has gone through deliverance and it wasn't done completely properly right and therefore the demon came back and brought seven more. He's going to very passionately discuss a person that has never gone through deliverance properly and that is why the enemy is able to come back because the door was never properly closed and the demon was never properly expelled to begin with. And let me prove that to you right here in the text. How many believe Bible preaching should come out of the Bible? Verse 43, Matthew 12. When the unclean spirit shout demon, that's what that is. When an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, stop. It's a very interesting phrase that he uses and why we've missed this, I don't know, maybe just a little laziness. When he has gone out of a man, when we talk, Mark chapter number 6, that we have the ability to expel demons through the power of the name of the Lord Jesus, when we are called to drive them out, to cast them out, to force them out, to push them out, it's a different word that's used than right here. Jesus told us we had power and authority to expel demons, but the phrase is gone out it's not the word in the original for expel. It is the word for exit. This demon was not driven out of someone through deliverance. It just chose by its own will because demons have a will. That's what damned them to begin with. He chose of his own will to exit that person. He came out. I'm going to show you that, right? He did this of his own volition. It's not because I drove him out. It's not because I prophesied him out. Not because I screamed him out. No. When an unclean spirit not is expelled, but when he has gone out, when he chooses to leave someone for what? He, he's not wrong, by the way. Uh, if you use the Step Bible app, I highly recommend that. It's a free downloadable app. Uh, it gives you the Greek. It is uh, The word here is to leave or to go forth or to go out. So, I mean, he's not wrong. It's... Uh, technically is, is to exit, though that's a very modern translation, but to leave would be the word. Every reason, because a demon can only be in one place at one time, but he can be anywhere he wants in that time. When he's gone out, the word, check it out, it means to exit. When he's gone out of a man, what does he do? Apparently he got bored. He just walks through dry places so he can rest finding none. He wants some rest. He's looking for another host. He's looking for somebody else. He's looking for another doorway, another portal, another gateway, another highway. He's bored. He's walking around. He's seeking peace. He's seeking rest. Of course, he doesn't get any because he knows what's coming. That's why demons always said, are you here to torment us before the time? They know that they are going to hell. Amen. And so he's seeking some sort of rest, some sort of respite, knowing that that day's coming. But notice, he exited himself. Watch this, verse 44. 
Then he saith, watch his will. I will return. See, he had the ability to walk out. And he had the same ability to turn around and walk back in. Now listen to me. I'm building something here. Don't miss this. We always say, well, you got to be careful because, man, when you go through deliverance, a demon will come back and bring seven more. Now, wait just a minute. Can you show me anywhere in the Bible that it is exemplified that a demon ever came back? No, but I can show you something very interesting if you'll flip over quickly to the book of Mark in chapter number 9. I'm going slow on purpose now. All right, so if he's going somewhere, Mark chapter, what do you say? Nine, I think. Don't get bored on me. I didn't give him this one, so apologize, guys, but thanks for getting it up there. Mark chapter number nine. I want you to see it. I could quote it, but you need to see it. Look at verse 25. This is the young boy that was nonverbal, deaf, mute. Throws himself in the fire, throws himself in the water, or at least the spirit that was in control did that. The dad was in dead earnest. Help us, help us, help us. Check this out, verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked. Say rebuked. Notice he didn't rebuke the daddy or the boy or the crowd. He rebuked the devil. He rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, comma, and enter no more into him. Jesus never gave us an example of a demon coming back, but he gave us a fine example of closing the door and telling him you can't come back no matter how much you want to. You see, we either have authority, Luke chapter 10, over serpents and scorpions or we don't. We can either evict them and let them be gone or we don't have the power to. But Jesus clearly gave us an example that not only can you expel them, you can forevermore evict them. Now, as to whether a demon does come back, do they? Yes. The point is, we have spooked people into believing a principle that's not biblical. Because the person involved in Matthew, which I need you to go back to, chapter number 12, is not someone that had a demon cast out. It was someone that had a demon that just chose to walk out of its own will, but eventually it got bored and decided, you know what? I think I'm going to go back. Now, watch this. This is interesting. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into, watch this, my, out loud, what's the next word? When someone goes to deliverance, their body is no longer the house of a demon. This demon could come in and out all it wanted to because it just exited. It wasn't expelled. Am I making sense? So here's the thing with this. And I think this is the reason that some people are so convinced by this. Is that he's laying out a, a case for demonology, essentially. Um, and exorcism and, and all of that. And he's doing so by going back and forth. But yet, at the same time, he's doing the same thing he said not to do at the very beginning of the sermon, which is you don't want to build, you know, a doctrine on just like a few verses or something. And he's using an example that Jesus is giving in this dissertation and answer to the scribes and Pharisees in order to build this doctrine on um, the returns of demons, basically, into a person's life. Now, we don't have a whole lot of examples or working through um, what it would look like to cast demons and devils out of people with the exception of what we do see in Jesus' life and the uh, power he gives the 72 that he sends out as well as the apostles and then Paul obviously and Luke as well. So there, it's not that it's devoid of examples and I'm not going to be able to go in honestly and again I've already stated I'm not some expert on this or even even acquainted with it. But just as a layman rando here watching this sermon, I can see why somebody be like, oh, wow, what are you saying? Sounds good. Um, I haven't looked into it. However, what I am saying is that he's not using the example Jesus gives here in the way that Jesus is using it. Does that make sense? It's not that, uh, like Jesus is teaching on if a demon can return or not. He's making a statement 
in, in a way that they would understand it to make his overall point, which is the state of the man is worse off now than it was to begin with. And he's using that line to tie it back to your guys' state is far worse now than it was before I came because now I've come and you've had the opportunity that you didn't take it. Whereas before you didn't even have the opportunity. And so Jesus isn't teaching on this. At, at best, giving using these verses, he's stating something that they would have understood in in what they did. And he's using that in a way to prove his point on who he is and um, just how much greater he is than Jonah and how much greater he is than Solomon. And so he's not teaching on demonology. He's simply saying, this is uh, something you guys understand. Uh, Jesus does this a lot. Um, so for example, he also does something similar in Matthew. I think it's 18. Uh, I believe it's Matthew 18 or 19. It's when he's teaching on divorce. Um, they have a question about divorce. And then he, he, he calls back to something that they understand, which is that, you know, Adam and Eve were created and they, they come together and they are one now. And so he's drawing on something that they get. Now, what I'm not saying is that uh, the this whole thing Greg Locke is talking about is on par with creationism, uh, creation and uh, the coming together of a man and a woman. I am saying this is the same sort of retor like uh, linguistical thing that Jesus is using to make his point, though. Um, so I would be very hesitant to build a doctrine off of an example that Jesus is using. He chose to leave, and he chose to come back, and it's going to get worse. And the context at the end of this next verse is what makes me believe that what I'm saying right now is tracking well theologically with the red letters of Jesus. The demon comes out. He says to himself, well, I'm going to go back to my house. I'm going to go back to my host. I wasn't driven out. I wasn't forced to leave. And I certainly wasn't told that I can't come back. And so I had the volition to leave. I've got the volition to go back. I will return unto my house. Watch this. From whence I came out. Every time Jesus gives us authority, it's to drive out demons, cast out demons, kick out demons. Now, again, us gives us Again, if we're looking at context of those verses, it's not him giving us. It's very specific who he's giving that authority to and the reason he gives them that authority. So let's be real careful and put, pump the brakes about who is given certain authority and when that authority is given. Evict demons. You know what happens when somebody gets evicted? They don't get to say, oh, that's my house. No, you got kicked out, Jack. It's not your house. And if you don't get your stuff, you lose your stuff. Because the contract says it's no longer yours. You've been evicted. Am I making sense? But this demon that was not evicted, he was only in exit mode. He said, I'm going to go back to my house. It's my body. It's my cottage. It's my cabin. It's my mansion. It's my place. It's my abode. I'm going to go back there because I still own it. Nobody made me leave. I just felt like leaving. I just got bored. You don't understand the mind of a demon. He's like, I'm, I'm just going to leave. But then he walks around. He's like, you know what? I think I'm going to go back. So check this out. And when he has come back, when the demon comes back to the same person, watch this. He findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. You know what I've seen countless times nearly every day? That there are people that are tormented by dreams, nightmares, addiction, heaviness, fear, anxiety, PTSD. But you know what happens when a demon just decides to up and leave for a while? Not, not through expelling, not through deliverance. You know what happens when a demon decides to leave? The person's life goes back to normal. We see it all the time in the world with lost people even. But certainly with saved people. 
You, you get a wife, she's, all of a sudden she's got this spirit of heaviness and she can't figure it out. She can't get out of bed and she's crying and she's hurt all the time and, and she has a spirit of offense. And you, you ask her what is wrong and she can't explain it and it gets worse and, and she can't do anything around the house and she can't help with the kids. And every single day she just seems to be going worse and worse and worse. And then all of a sudden one day she just snaps out of it. She didn't go to church service. She didn't have no hands laid on her. She didn't drink no anointing oil. The torment just decided to leave her. So what happened? She wakes up the next day. She's like, wow, I feel like mowing the grass. Woo, I see my kids in a whole new life. Hello, husband, I love you. Right? And, and all of a sudden, she's like back in her right mind. She's like, man, I don't even, I didn't even know what a vacuum was for six months. Let me see that. Thing. Whoa, she's like riding on it all over the house, getting excited. She's like, whoa, I want to wake up to clean the house. She just snapped back. This is ironic, just because of what he said before. He he stated not everything is a demon. And so it's sort of like this weird... I'm sure he could explain it if he was given time. But he, he entered with not everything is a demon. And now is saying, hey, this thing here is probably a demon. Because, you know, she just was heavy for a little bit. She just snapped right back into reality. She's not staring at the floor anymore. She's like, man, I just... I didn't take any medication. And I didn't go to church. And... Didn't have a crucifix stuck in my face. My goodness. I just feel good. So the demon comes back and says, oh, really? Torment gone. Nightmare's gone. Marriage getting back together. Kids doing well. The house all swept up. She's all prettied up, all gussied up. It could be a man, a woman, a kid. You get the analogy. So the demon comes back and finds the house just empty, right? Empty as it was when he left. Door still open. And tell you something. You leave your front door open long enough and something's coming in your house. Something's coming in if you leave the door open long enough. Just by logical process of elimination, something's coming in. So he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. It's all cleaned up, it's gussied up, printed up. Maybe got in church, who knows? But watch this, verse 45. Then goeth he and taketh with himself. See, he's still in control of the narrative. He's never been evicted. He's never been told or asked even not to come back. So what does he do? He taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. So he goes down to the, the demon bar. <laughs> I don't know. Finds seven of them sitting up on a tall stool. And he's like, hey, boys, y'all ready to party? You more wicked, you more wicked, you more perverse, you more wicked, you more wicked, you more wicked. Let's roll, boys. So he gathers them together. Watch this. This is interesting. This is why Jesus is about to say something mind-blowing gathers them together, more wicked than himself, and they enter in. They still had legal rights through the gatekeeper to get in. It was still his house. This person had not gone through deliverance. The demon just decided to walk out and decided to walk back in. What's interesting here is that he keeps like honing in on deliverance, right? That's the whole thing. The deliverance had not happened. This demon chose to leave. This demon comes to come back. The, and the reason he can come back is because deliverance hasn't been done. Again, I know like some people are like, yeah, this is obvious what you're about to say. And some people are like, no, you're missing the point entirely. Jesus' point in this example has nothing to do with like telling them that they should do deliverance ministries. Uh, he's not even speaking of it. Now, they did do exorcisms. I, the Pharisees, I know it's, we don't we don't talk about it. Just historically, we have like historically we know that that is a thing that happened occasionally. The Pharisees went and did exorcisms. Um, it's not written of a lot. We don't have I don't think any examples in scripture of it. But historically, we know what happened. Just like we know in the early church, there was this whole there there uh, especially when you start getting into like Roman Catholicism, there is this demonology and this you know specific priest for casting out demons. Like that's not an untrue statement. Now, is it, is it theologically correct? We could get into, but the point is that like these things exist. However, Jesus's point here, again, this is why I read the whole thing within context. So we could see it. It's really easy to think that Jesus is talking about a theological point here. If you just read 43 through 45, but understanding what he's saying in connection with it before like he's not denying the reality of demons, not that Jesus would, because all through his ministry, he cast out demons, but he's using that as an example. 
not a, a, a proof text of, of demons entering and leaving. Locke is using it as a proof text for that, but Jesus is using it as an example. That's why you need deliverance to close the door so he can't come back in. So he can't just in and out. No, no, you drive him out. You don't just let him make up his mind. And so the Bible says that they enter in of their own will. And what do they do? They dwell there. They're like fluffing up the couch, turning on the big screen. What the Bible says, King James, they dwell there. They're not just sitting around twirling their thumbs. Oh, we have nothing better to do. Oh, no, no, they're tormenting. Worse than they were before. Now the wife can't get out of bed for days on end. Now she totally ignores her husband, her children, the dogs, the cat. She, she can't do nothing. She, she just starts letting herself go and she starts getting sickly and she starts losing all sorts of weight and man, she starts just feeling like she's gonna vomit all the time and she can't do anything spiritual. She tries to watch preaching on YouTube and she makes her sick and nauseous. It's worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And get this, the one and the seven have still never been asked to leave. Here's, here's what I'm really interested to hear. I'm interested to see if he will include the second half of verse 45 when it says, so also will it be with this evil generation. Because if he does not include that, it, it basically tells me that he understands the context but refuses to use the context. Now, if he does use it, I'll be interested to see if he ties it in with the context because so it will also be with this generation unquestionably points back to verses uh, 38 through 42. So which, which way will he go with this? So guess what they have the ability to do? As long as the house is still owned and operated by him, them, they can leave at will, make this person feel better about themselves for a few days, maybe a few months. But then, after they've already brought all those wicked spirits in, they can leave and still get more and come back, get more and come back. What we call that is demonic compounded interest. And this person went from being half decent okay to being fully subjugated and controlled by demons. Because every time they at will walk out, they at will bring more back with them for the party. Okay, before I read the next part, does that make sense so far? Yeah. This is why Jesus says what he says. Even so, into verse 45. Shall it be also unto this wicked generation? What does that have to do with demons? Everything. I never understood that part. It was like the, the skip this part in the Bible, right? I don't understand that part. So let's just, you know, talk about the seven coming back, scare everybody into deliverance service, and then just skip that. No, no, no. That is there to prove what I just said. Because he said in this wicked generation, here's what's going to happen. Because people truly don't get delivered... Because demons are just at will leaving and coming back willy-nilly anytime they want to. And because nobody has taken real authority to drive them out. Because the context would know the religious people didn't even believe in that. They thought it was demonic to drive out demons. That, that's, oh my goodness gracious. <sighs> He's talking about context and ignores the context from before. Also, admittedly, we don't have any 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 proof as far as the Pharisees driving out demons, but within the within the the, the text here, and I really I'm gonna have to try to find it, and I'll try to find it and put it in the comment section or the description below where this was a not a common practice, but a practice that Pharisees did do the driving out demons. So it's not like they don't believe it. It's not like they have never seen it. Jesus using the example in and of itself within answering the question demonstrates that they understood what he was saying. So basically, we've went down the path that he's not going to connect it to context at all, even though it clearly is connected to context. In fact, he's making an, an enormous assumption that they don't believe Jesus uh, or demon possession at all, which 
it would be a it would be such a ridiculous example to use for the point he's making if they didn't believe it. The reason he's using the example is because they do believe it, and he's using it as a powerful example to demonstrate that they're going to be way worse off after him than they were before because now they've had the opportunity to hear him preach and hear his wisdom, and they've denied it anyway. I am not... <laughs> the smartest person in the world, y'all. I went to public school. I did terrible there. But you can read it and the context is incredibly clear about how this ties together. I don't see how he's missing it. So Jesus said, you know what your problem is? You are compounding the interest of demonic activity in this generation. So what's happening is the generation cannot get better because there's been no deliverance. The generation can only get worse because the demons keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And bigger. So in 1995 in this nation, the homosexual said, all we want is to be recognized. Hmm? Help me, Holy Ghost. He's going to use uh, moral decay within uh, the United States to prove demonic possession now, I think. That's the direction we're going. All of the positivity that was in the first 15 minutes of this sermon is quickly degrading. And we did nothing with it. So the demons were at will in the culture to not just leave, but to come back with more buddies. So we went from 1995, we just want to be recognized, to 2023, if you don't use my pronoun, you will lose your job. And your kids will be subjected to drag queens in a public library that your tax dollars pays for. And in some churches, sad to say. So how do we go from 95 to 2023? There's been no real power and authority of driving out demons. So this wicked generation gets more wicked because the demons are coming and going and coming and going. And it's compounded interest and they're getting worse and they're getting worse and they're getting worse. And if you think it's bad now, let's stay quiet for 20 more years and see what happens in this buckwild nation. Okay, so... Um... There were, um, for all intents and purposes, drag queens in the Roman Empire. A lot of, a lot of cultures, actually. Um, there was a lot of homosexual activity in Rome and a lot of other cultures. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying it was there. Because a culture apart from Christ, not knowing the redemptive power and the reconciliation that can be made through Christ to the Father... You're going to follow your sinful passions. Now, am I saying that some of that isn't demonic? Look, we clearly know that demons are real. We clearly know that they can enter people. We clearly know they do a variety of different things. We have Legion as an example. We have the boy that was thrown into the fire as an example. Like We have examples that they are destructive to people. And so I'm not saying that isn't maybe part of it. I'm simply saying that if you're going to talk about from 1995 to 2023, uh, that's not all demonic activity. Um, you have at that same time a de-churching of lots of people that moved from a, a cultural morality that was connected to Christianity to a cultural morality that isn't connected to Christianity. So therefore, the morality and the morals definitionally change because they don't have a base or a foundation. Um, they're just sort of whatever the culture wants. And so it's completely devoid and disconnected from, from Christ's teachings. And so you're going to see some morphine there. And I think what you have seen is that, um, but to say, so it will be in this evil generation or this wicked generation. Again, you cannot pull 43 verses 43 through 45 out of the context that it's in. This is clearly within Answering the question of the scribes and Pharisees, he, there, there's, there's so many evidences of that. Um, so we've, we've completely pulled this out of context, and now we're making points that I'm not saying are altogether 
incorrect, though I'm going to say that I'm going to use his own words. Not everything's a demon. Sometimes it's just sin. It's terrible, terrible sin. Even so shall it be. What does that mean? The demons are coming and going at will because nobody's taking authority over them. That's the context. So can a demon come back? Yes, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is we've scared people and said, well, you know, you better be real careful. You better drink carrot juice tonight. I know you went through five deliverance services, but you listen to me right now. If you even have an evil thought, he's coming back in seven more with him. You know what that kind of preaching has done? Filled up deliverance services with people that don't need deliverance. Am I helping somebody? So let me, let me, let me give you three things. Greg, Greg Locke seems like a guy, and this is just observation, that when he gets like locked on to something, he is going at it full bore. Like if it's politics, 110 gas, uh, pedal to the metal gas. Like just, if it's deliverance, pedal to the metal. Like whatever he zeroes in on, he's going to give it 110%. He's not going to be right, but he's going to give it 110%. Right here that, 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 that you're going to need, and then we're going to go somewhere else just for a minute. You see, deliverance ministry is threefold. We cast out demons. We pull down strongholds. We break off curses. Those are three very different things. Generational curses, demons, strongholds. Three very different things. But here's what I want you to know. With demons, they need deliverance. Okay, the person needs deliverance. How do you get a demon out? Deliverance. So write that down. We'll give you three D's. You ready? How do you get the demons out? How do you drive evil spirits out? Deliverance. How do you get the stronghold taken care of? Discipline. Some of you don't need a demon cast out. Some of you just need some discipline to read your Bible every day. Some of you don't need a demon driven out. You just need to say no to sin of the flesh. I'll prove that to you in a minute. So demons come out through deliverance. Strongholds come down through discipline. Curses come off through decree. You decree them off, people. I decree and declare. Okay, guys, hold up. Now, here's the thing. Here, here's all I'm going to say, and then I'm going to get back into it because we've got 20-ish minutes left of his preaching. I know you guys are in it with me. If you've made it this far, leave a comment. Uh, you, you, if you make it to the end of this, you're a VIP. This is also why most people will not take the full context of everything that somebody said from a clip because it takes too long. Anyway, so he's talked about cast out demons through deliverance. He's talked about breaking whole, down strongholds for, through discipline. And he's talked about breaking curses through decree. Now, he has not, as of yet, connected any of these to actual scriptures. We'll see if he does. But if you're going to give me three D's in which I have to do for demon casting out demons and breaking all of that stuff, you better give me context to scripture. Now, you've already lost me on the ability that I think you can do that because of how much you butchered this context. But I'm going to give you a second chance because everybody deserves a second chance to see if you can give me context for these three pillars of your thought process. So let's go. And, and let me say something about generational curse. I know we as a group say the same thing every Sunday night and when I travel on the bus. And I get that. And we got people I say, you know, just say the same thing. But when it comes to somebody's life, like if, if I call off of you, for example, whatever, if, if I call off of you a generational curse that has been passed down from the Masonic Lodge, can I tell you something? I decreed that generational curse to be broken off. You agreed with it. You tore up covenant with the enemy. You don't have to have that curse called off 50 more times. It's done. And sometimes in deliverance ministry, we're trying to break the same curses off people that have been broken off. And we're like, we're trying to convince them that what they have is something that's already been broken off. And what we're doing is word cursing them. Oh, you know, you got it. Oh, yeah, I guess I do. Death and life, the power of the tongue. Once you broke off a generational curse, you don't have to break it off again. It's generational. It stops. You decree it stopped. Now, that doesn't mean 
that you don't have to throw down and break off curses that come against you now. I'm talking about generational curses in the bloodline. Once you burn the altar, she's burnt. Now, if somebody witches you, if somebody curses you, if somebody false prophesies or false prays against you, you can break that off. Psalms even says, let him that love cursing have it return unto him again. Did you know it is scriptural to say to people that curse you in that way, return to sender. There's a difference in somebody cursing us as far as... Okay, so we don't have time to go do that and look at that psalm, but I'm going to almost guarantee you that's not what it's talking about. I'm, I don't know. Go do your own research. Use biblical exegesis to do so. Um, but I'm going to say probably not. Blankety blank blank and persecuting, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, bless those that curse you. That's a different kind of cursing. But when somebody puts a curse on you, that's a whole new ball game. Ch -ch -ch. You can ratchet things up a little bit on that. You can envelope things up a little bit on that. The Bible says, let it return unto them again. Now, it's the Lord that'll do it, not us. But deliverance takes care of the demons. Discipline takes care of the strongholds. And decreeing, biblically, by faith, through the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus, takes care of the curses. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to notice one more time, verse number 43, before we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. Then he says, I will return into, and again, I, I need you to see these words, my house. Now listen, this is where things get nitty gritty. You need to pay attention to this, okay? Demons fortify themselves in your life by building a house. The Bible calls that fortified place or city a stronghold. It's a house. It's a habitation. So here's where we've missed it. And I'm just trying to, to right the ship, okay? We wonder, why do these people keep coming back? back for the same pro we've cast this demon out five times no 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 you'll drive that demon out one good time moving forward you'll tell it not to come back at least i will and from that moment on it doesn't mean the person is not going to struggle because let me tell you something when the demon came out of the person just real quick, that's what I was looking at, just so you guys know what I was looking down. Uh, this word that um, Jesus uses in this example when he says, my house. Again, this is not the point of the passage, but just to humor you, um, the word used here isn't even elusive to stronghold. Um, we'll look at that word here in a minute. I'm sure he'll bring it up. We'll pull it up in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll look at it. Um, but the word he's using is just um, a physical edifice, a house, a home, a place someone lives. It can also be connected to sort of like a temple, but this is the same uh, sort of usage that Paul uses when he says our bodies are a temple for the Holy Spirit. Our, our bodies are a home for the Holy Spirit. Um, so that that's the same type of word usage that Paul then pulls from later. Um, so there's kind of the crossover um, that Paul does use as this the same word, but it's translated temple instead of house. Um, and when we get, I guarantee you, when we get to second Corinthians chapter 10, this is going to look differently. Uh, this word's going to mean something different. I'm not there yet, but I'm sure when we get there, we'll look at it. Notice what he left behind the house. The I don't know if you can hear it. I'm sorry. I'm laughing. That's good teaching. That's good teaching. Spirit is entered in through some doorway. It builds itself. Derek Prince calls it a nest. It builds itself a comfortable place. And you can cast the demon out, tell it to never come back. But if you don't teach the person to break down the stronghold that the enemy built and they have no discipline, they're always going to feel like they have a demon when really what they need to do is just control their flesh. We drive demons out all the time. 
but we've not reached a place where we understand you have to pull down the stronghold that the demon left behind. Because I'm going to tell you something. When you cast out the spirit of sexual perversion, it's got to leave. So does the person still struggle with porn because they still have a demon? No, they still struggle with porn because the fortified house is still there and the stronghold has to be pulled down. And you don't do that through more deliverance. You do that through more discipline. Like, here's the thing. Where is any of this coming from with a biblical backing? I mean, at the very beginning, he said, like, hey, you biblical preaching comes from the Bible, right? Yes. And then he went to the Bible, even though he butchered the context. But the point is, you go to the Bible, right? That's his own standard. Uh, that would clearly be mine, too. You go to the Bible. But where's any of this in the Bible, then? Like, if you can prove that it's, like, lay it out, then. In, in a clear theological way within scripture without taking it out of context. That's kind of key too. The house is still there. Let me prove this to you. I need you to go. Some of you looking at me crazy. Go to second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Whew. Somebody better shout teach. I'm feeling it tonight. Amen. Second Corinthians. Chapter 10. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back into verse 3. I told him to do 4 and 5, but I want to I wanna back into to, to verse number 3 because I think it's important. For though we walk in the what? Flesh. You see, you have a flesh that's bad all by itself without demons, <laughs> without curses, okay? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, which doesn't mean that we don't war. It just means we don't war. According to the flesh, because this is not a fleshly, earthly battle. It's a spiritual, supernatural battle. And that's why the Bible says that when we put on the armor of God, what are we doing? We're standing against the trickery of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness in high places. So notice, once this spirit is driven out, watch what happens in verse number four. For the weapons, shout the word weapons. Now, let me tell you why that's interesting. Because did you know of all of the armor of God, every bit of it except one piece is to protect you, not to fight with. And he calls it... A okay, so really quick, this is important. Anytime you're pulling across a metaphors from one letter to another, you've got to be real careful. There's a reason that Paul in Ephesians uses this this picture of uh the armor of god like it's it's purposeful within the context of what he's using it for when you try to pull that out of context and then put it into second corinthians chapter 10 when you're talking about weapons of our wherefore not of flesh and blood uh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds you're 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 crossing like he's not <laughs> He wrote that, like that analogy within a particular context to communicate something. Now, it doesn't mean that principles don't transfer across letters or whatnot, because we see principles even from the Old Testament applying to the New Testament. So principles are, 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 are true and can be true across all sorts of letters and places and cultures and all of that. Specific examples within context are important, and sometimes they can be pulled across. You just have to be careful you're not stretching them and bending them to their breaking point because they were meant for a particular context that they were being told in. So let's, I, I'll be very interested to see how he uses the, uh, the Ephesians uh, armor of God here in second Corinthians. A weapon. So it, we're not besmirching the text. But if we were to be honest, everything is for offense. There's only one thing that's for defense. The only real weapon you have to fight back with, Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What does the shield of faith do? It quenches the fiery darts of the wicked. It takes what comes against you. It doesn't dish anything back out. The shoes protect you. The helmet protects you. The breastplate protects you. The, the belt of truth protects you. There's only one thing that defends you. The weapon of discipline. God's weapon of choice is the Bible, the Word of God. 
Now watch this. He says, for the weapons of our warfare, because we're in a battle, are not carnal. But what are they? They're mighty through God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. Okay, so that's KJV. Um, just real quick so we can see a cross comparison. For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, uh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. I'm not going to go back to the Greek to see like the closest thing here, but the point being is that he's not... The, the crossover of uh, the armor of God and the sword being the weapon uh, in the Bible, there be, being the sword, uh, you cannot cross pull over to when Paul is talking about, hey, the weapons we're fighting with are not physical weapons. They're not physical ones. They're not ones that you would think of as, hey, this is a physical sword. I'm going to take a physical sword and fight a spiritual battle. He's specifically saying, for the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh and blood but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to uh, punish every disobedience when our obedience is complete. Um, We'll see how far he gets into this, but the, the, the whole point being is that it's not the weapons that we would think of that you would typically fight uh, with, but rather they have, he says, divine power to destroy strongholds. Now I'm going to pull, while he keeps going, I am going to, you're going to see me looking down at my phone because I want to pull up strongholds here uh, to see if his point holds from earlier as far as the actual way the word is used. Wow. How'd the stronghold get there? Somebody strong held it. Somebody built something in your life. Somebody built something in your marriage. Somebody built something in your mind. When the demon left, he still had a house to return to. Have you ever noticed this is a fascinating observation? I'm not trying to be gross. If you have a gag reflex, plug your ears. Do you ever notice in deliverance ministry? And I know it's not all about vomiting and throwing up and we got turbulent bags and all that kind of stuff. You ever notice? This is crazy. I've seen thousands of people vomit. In churches and movie theaters. You know what's interesting, Pastor Boggs? I've never seen anyone throw up what they ate that day. You ever notice that? I've never seen someone go through deliverance from a demon and be like, oh, <laughs> chicken. Papa John's? Mm-mm. Never. Isn't that interesting? You ever notice it's always, excuse me, that white, weird, it's white, it's green, or it's brown. It's only three colors it comes in. Now, real quick, white, green, brown, white would be like, obviously like saliva. Uh, green is like bow uh, and brown is, well, green and brown are different bowel uh, acidities, but those are also things that are in your stomach. And you're like... Well, they just drank red Kool-Aid. Why didn't they throw that up? Here's what Derek Prince said about it. He said, it's the nest that the demons lived in breaking loose from a person. So what happens if you deal with a demon, but you don't deal with a nest? You still have a stronghold. Because here's where things get tricky, can get controversial. I'm not trying to make up a new doctrine. I'm just telling you from facts, from, from my life experience, and no doubt from yours as people of Deliverance Church. When a demon's driven out, if the stronghold is still there, still built in that person, you don't need a demon to operate it. Your flesh will move right in. I'm not trying to make up a new doctrine, but I have no scripture to back this up. It's just my experience, but I'm, I'm not, not making up a new doctrine. Derek Prince said it. So yeah, it's solid. I have no clue who Derek Prince is, but if Derek Prince is telling you that the things that people throw up during deliverance ministries are the nest that demons live in, in your body, that's crazy. I'm just, I just that's crazy guys. That's crazy. You cannot anywhere in here. Where's that right there? You can't, you can't show me anywhere in here where the things that you throw up during deliverance ministry is the nest of the demon 
And if you do tell me that, and then tell me that it's not a new doctrine you're making up, and expect me to take you seriously, you're on a whole nother level. Now, <laughs> to bring this back, um, stronghold within the context of what we see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 is what you would expect. Uh, a stronghold also known as uh, a fortress, sometimes translated as prison, um, but basically like a, a bulwark of error or vice would be the uh, a very generic way to translate it. So the idea being is our, for our weapons are... Uh, an, I'm sorry, our weapons of our welfare are not of flesh or flesh or blood, but have divine power to pull and down and destroy prisons or bulwarks of vice, right? So um, the idea is that the weapons we fight with aren't physical, rather they're spiritual, and these spiritual weapons actually destroy things of vice in your life. And taken just at that, that is, that could be done completely apart from this deliverance ministry that he keeps going on about. The reality is that when you're a believer and you're in the word, your weapons are not physical, but rather they are what God has said. And when you read them, they tear down through the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the strongholds of vice you have in your life. So you may not think that X, Y, Z is bad. And then you're reading along and the Holy Spirit convicts you through the word of God that, hey, I shouldn't be doing, saying, participating in this because God says it's wrong. It is acting as a weapon of warfare against that fortress of vice in your life to tear it down. I mean, you can connect this to, to demon possession, I suppose, and deliverance if you'd like, but that's not what we have any connection with here at all. It's just silly. All right, guys, um, 10 more minutes. <laughs> just 10. Well, a little bit longer because I'm sure I'll interrupt, but you are a, you're, you're sports for still being here. And be very comfortable with the house that an evil spirit built in you. And so it's not in Matthew chapter 12 about a demon being driven out and bringing back seven more. No, no, no. The principle is this. No, he's right. It's not about that. It's about the uh, generation not accepting Jesus. That's, that's what he's going to say, right? That's what, that's what the example is about demon just decided to do what it wanted to so we're talking about people that have really gone through deliverance if you've really gone through deliverance the demon is gone now you need discipline to deal with what it left behind so you can close every door and not make things sometimes even worse in your life so we have to learn the difference between deliverance and discipline Where's my little dealio back here? These guys on this side? Where we Here's the example that went viral. Now, within most clips, if you watch the clip, you go, well, that's pretty terrible. And then when you watch it in context, you go, this is way worse than just the clip. And in this case, it's way worse than just the clip. Everything we've covered up to this point is like, oh, that's why you think this is okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, dear sir. That is a Bible. That is uh, duct taped and zip tied to an Easton ball bat. Let me show you. I'm about to show you something crazy. Watch this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the, watch the next phrase, pulling down of strongholds. You ought to pay attention to what the Greek word for pulling down means. It's the word demolition. That's what it means. It doesn't just mean, well, you know, I'm just going to pull it. Uh -uh 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 -uh. It means you demolish the house that the evil spirit left when you kicked it out. So maybe our, our global... Hey, he's right. If you look at the Greek, it does say demolition. 
And now he's about to use the most cliche youth pastor example of using some random thing to get your attention example that he can in an over-the-top example. This is like Mike Todd level. Vision store, we ought to start selling some Bible bats in the name of Jesus. Because what some of you need to understand is you've been delivered from a demon, but you've not pulled down the stronghold yet. You got to get rid of the triggers on that iPhone. You got to get rid of the triggers on that Netflix. You got to lose her number. You got to lose his number. The demon comes out when you expel it. The stronghold comes down when you demolish it with the Bible. start tearing that mess up you gotta break it down you gotta cast down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself you gotta get in the bible and beat that stronghold to death okay so let's let's um let's read real quick uh for the weapons of our warfare are not flesh but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We've already talked about that. We destroy arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Hmm. Being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So, We've teared down the strongholds. We've already talked about that by being in the word through sanctification in the spirit. And we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, being with the word of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So whenever you need to lose someone's number or not to participate in something, you're doing so because you're taking that captive to obey Jesus. See, that wasn't dramatic, and I didn't hit a baseball bat uh, that had a Bible tied to it against a dollhouse, but it kind of gets the same point across, is that you you say, that thing that I want to do, I'm taking it captive because I want to obey Jesus. So I'm not going to do that thing. Why? Because I want to obey Christ. And, and he, he keeps going because you're ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. You want to be obedient to Christ, and therefore you take the thought captive, Punishing your disobedience by not being obedient to your disobedience. You know what God's word says and you do it because you want to be obedient to Jesus. And part of tearing down that stronghold, it seems to say, is that even when that stronghold of vice or error is still in your life and maybe you don't want to tear it down, by being in the word, that tears it down so that when it comes up again and you there's this, there's apparently this, this pool to disobey, you take that thought captive because what you know what the word of God says and you use the word of God to obey God well. It doesn't have to be dramatic, guys. Just read your Bible. Like it's silliness. That you think you got to yell and scream and tie a Bible to a baseball bat to get the point across. This has nothing to do with demon deliverance at all. It's just disappointing that that we're twisting the word so much to make a point that's not even important right now. Not, it's not at all connected to the text. Change your phone number if you got to. So, do I believe in deliverance? Yes. But I'm done with repeat customers for 20 years. It either works or it don't. We decree them curses off. We drive them demons out. But then as a pastor, I got to teach you how to be disciplined. You got to get in the word. You got to say no to stuff. You got to say yes to stuff. You got to learn to pray. Mark 9, 29, you got to learn to fast. 
He says we pull down, we demolish the strongholds. So for some of you, let's just be honest. You've gone through deliverance and you're like, oh my goodness. Look, I'm not saying, please hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying an evil spirit can't return if you open a door. Real quick, since we're already an hour and 40 minutes into this, might as well cover this. Uh, Mark 9.29, or Mark 9.29 uh, is a classic passage used um, to talk about deliverance and casting out demons and whatnot. Um, I would encourage you, if you have a physical Bible, uh, to turn there because there's something I want you to check. Uh, hopefully it's there. But if you go to Mark 9, uh, you go to the end, Mark 9, 29. If you have a study Bible um, or something like that, it would be interesting to, to go there. Uh, this one, for example, uh, Mark 9, 28, 29, the study Bible that I have says, uh, why could we not cast it out? Besides lacking understanding, the disciples lack the ability to fully carry out their commission from Jesus. Their failure is on occasion for the encouragement and more prayer, implying that they need uh, time and effort to pray and therefore to uh, close, closer fellowship to God, which leads to faith. Now, there's also a footnote uh, in some of these Bibles as well, if it's not in the study part, it will be in the footboat that says uh, some manuscripts add with tears. And then my second footnote in connection with uh, verse 29 says some manuscripts include and fasting. So some of your Bibles are going to say, and he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out except through anything but prayer. Uh, which is what my Bible says. And then it says some manuscripts add and fasting. And so when he says, hey, it has to be fasting, uh, he's using the King James Version uh, in which those manuscripts used the later manuscripts that also have the word fasting in it. Not that that changes a whole lot other than in some people's theology it does because even though Greg has said beforehand, you don't build your theology just off of a few verses, there are people that drive their whole philosophy off of um, casting out demons based on the fact that you haven't fasted uh, because it's in some of the manuscripts and you have to wrestle through. We don't have time to go into that, but we're already pretty far into two hours worth of a sermon review. So let's finish this up. I'm saying that this idea that just because you still struggle means you still got demons has kept people in theological bondage and that's why people have a hard time with deliverance ministry because everything's not a demon sometimes you just need to have some discipline okay sometimes you just need to push back from the table and be like all right five chicken legs is enough i'm done right but i'm telling you if you don't get forceful and start tearing down those strongholds in your life. They're going to get worse. Can I tell you something? There are people in this room. People online. And people that you know. And people that you love. That have gone through deliverance. And still have an addiction. What are you going to for the next 10 years of your life? Scream spirit of pharmacia come out. He either comes out or he don't. No, no, no. you got to change their mindset. you got to change their lifestyle. They have to be renewed in the spirit of the mind. They have to learn. Now the demon's gone. Now i got to say no to my flesh, which is just as dastardly as a demon. Because So see, this part's not necessarily wrong. You, we have scripture for that, for denying your flesh, for taking up your cross, for following after Christ, for specifically denying yourself. Um, again, obeying Christ. This is what second Corinthians was talking about was saying, I I'm going to obey Christ instead of obey, obey my, my flesh. I mean, to yes, on second Corinthians chapter 10. Did you know that one of the works of the flesh is witchcraft? Galatians 5 plainly says that. I find it interesting that people say, well, you know, I don't believe a Christian can be influenced by a demon. Your flesh can produce witchcraft. Don't get much more demonized than that. And so am I making sense? And I man, we could go a long time and there's just, there's, there's so much in my heart, but I'm thinking to myself, well, why sometimes is it so powerful? But why does it seem like for some people, it just don't work? It does work. We're just looking at it wrong. Because the fact that you still struggle 
does not mean you're lost. The struggle is proof of who you are in Christ. Lost people don't struggle with sin. But saved people do. Listen, nurse, before I got saved, I could do some crazy stuff and laugh in your face. Nowadays, I'm like, man, I got to repent. I can't do that. I can't even sleep myself at night. The difference. Amazing how much swinging that Bible battle where you at, praise God. I'm trying to catch my breath. But I think we got the point. So yeah, you better believe I'm going to spend my life casting out demons. But if I'm going to feed the sheep, I'm going to have to spend the other half of my life teaching people how to be disciplined and say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things. That's what the Word of God teaches. So I hope it was worth leaving the young people in for, but I'm here to tell you, we've scared people to death with this seven times worse principle. He wasn't talking about somebody who went through deliverance. He was talking about somebody that needed deliverance because once you go through deliverance, deliverance takes care of the demon. And if it don't, Jesus didn't really give us authority. That's a whole nother thing to go through, which we don't have time. So yeah, I know sometimes it takes longer and, and, and the, can I say it this way? The better you get at it, the, the more discerning of spirits you have. You can take five hour deliverances and you can put them in 15 minutes. Not all of them are quick, not all of them are long. We have another common misconception. Even my preacher friends are like, well, you know, Jesus just spoke the word and them demons came right out. That is not true. You ever read Mark chapter five? The Bible says twice, the demons besought him much. You know what the word much means? It means Jesus carried on a conversation for a while with these stupid things. You know what it says when Paul looked at the woman with the spirit of a divination in Acts 16. He said, come out of her. And the Bible says he came out the same hour. He didn't say, okay. You know, see, sometimes it's difficult. We don't know what the context is. But here's what the Bible says. Sometime within an hour, came out. And everybody's like, well, you know, I just walk up into a room and I say, out. And they're like, Pfft. and I'm like, well, I want what you got. Sometimes it's super simple. But when they're holding on to the nest, you got to uproot them. And by the way, you will notice, okay, this is just coming to me right now and we got to quit. I'm about to starve to death. I'm hungry as a hostage. Praise God. <laughs> you, you will, that's our next book, Hungry as a Hostage. You will notice. <laughs> that the narrative would denote this. I, I think we can take a, uh, a pastoral observation and, 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 and make this leap without, without being theologically unsavvy. You'll notice that the seven that came back with the guy are not even the ones that we need to be concerned with. That's why it takes so long. We're going through a manual Trying to find seven of them. When all we need to do is fast, pray, walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, have discerning of spirits, and go for that first one that brought the seven back into the house to begin with. And once you get the gatekeeper, the rest of them will come squealing like little baby piglets. So praise be unto God for deliverance ministry, but praise be unto God for Christian discipleship too. For Christian discipleship. Yeah, you better believe I believe in demons. They're crazy. They ever work. Yeah. Right? But I believe in discipline too. Believe in the renewing of your mind. The filling of your heart and your mind with the Word of God. The filling of your house with worship music. Your eye gate, your ear gate, your mouth gate. Every part of you being brought in to the right things. Because when you bring in the right things, you'll push out the right things. Computer technicians have a, have a phrase, G-I-G-O, gigo, garbage in, garbage out. You put garbage into a computer, you get garbage out of a computer. You know, none of, again, we're ending kind of how we began. None of this particular advice is bad. What you hear and see is what you will probably say and do. This is, yeah, that's exactly what happens. It's the, well, we'll get to that in a minute when we close. Let's keep going. Don't believe me? Look at windows. <laughs> garbage in, garbage out. So let, let, let's go from uh, let's go from gigo to bibbo. Bible in, Bible out. You fill yourself with the word of God, and it'll just come popping out all over you. It'll just come popping out. 
Also not a bad concept, but in context. So demons come out through deliverance. Strongholds get demolished through discipline. And curses come off through decreeing. But in all three cases, one thing is the common denominator. The power is in the name of Jesus. Amen, church. Would you stand with me, please? Thank you for letting me speak to you tonight. Thank you for letting me just share my heart. Father, thank you for the word of the Lord. Okay, so that's the end of it. He's got like one minute left. So, hey, hour and 50 minutes in, if you guys are still with me, you are pretty cool. You're amazing. Thank you. Um, so this is the reason we look at the full context of the sermon, right? I don't want to take one little clip of Greg Locke taking a baseball bat with the Bible attached to it, bashing a dollhouse and making a statement. I've done that a few times and it didn't turn out well because everybody's like, well, the context is there. You don't know his heart. You don't know his intent. Fine. Let's look at the whole thing. That's how these sermon reviews were born, right? Was the idea of let's look at the whole thing. Cause I don't know of anybody else that looks at the whole thing. And I know why nobody looks at the whole thing because it takes forever in a day. And this isn't like everyone's cup of tea. And this is not how you get a lot of views, but here's the point. Watching the whole thing gives us a really good picture of Greg Locke's view. So let's go over the three, three things. Did he read the scripture? Well, he read a portion of scripture. Did he exegete that using context and culture to bring out application? No, no, he did not. In fact, I think, I, I don't know of any way to prove it more thoroughly than to have read the verses before and after it and show that they connect together. And that example, it, what he read is an example that Jesus is bringing into an answer that he's given to the Pharisees and scribes. It's very clear that that's the case. And so, no, he didn't exegete it using uh, context and culture because there's even a point where he says the Pharisees or the, the scribes and the Pharisees don't believe in um, exorcism, which uh, they do. Again, hopefully I was able to find that article and put it below. I'm hoping. Um, and so we've just completely missed that. And the third, did he preach the gospel of Christ? Well, he, to be fair, he did just mention at the end that all of, all of these things are done in the name and power of Jesus Christ. So, so one of two things is going to be true here. One, he assumes that everybody in this, in his tent, uh, is saved and they don't need to hear about Jesus' perfect life, his death in their place, uh, his resurrection bodily from the grave, his ascension into heaven and his coming back again to judge the living and the dead. He maybe assumes that everybody in there knows it, or maybe he just didn't mention it because that's the assumption he just has. And he didn't think to include it. Um, but if you're visiting there, like us, right? I mean, me, I don't watch Greg Locke all the time. So what I came up away from this sermon is, is not the power of Christ in one's life, but the concern I have to have about having curses on my life or demons in my life or things cast out of me. It wasn't the power of Jesus over all things. It wasn't his sovereignty and knowledge of everything that's occurred, um, and my reconciliation to him through the father and what that means in a real, real way. Um, I came away with deliverance is needed. Ca casting out, casting downs of strongholds is, is like a thing that I really need to be worried about. And that uh, apparently the casting off of curses in some weird way, because we didn't mention any of that in the text. And so, no, the glory of God is not declared here. It's basically a defense for deliverance ministry, basically. So yeah, there's that. I'm sure there'll be a lot of you lovely people that will disagree with me. If you do, make sure you leave it in the description below. If you did, however, find this helpful though, uh, make sure you like it, uh, you share it if you think somebody needs to hear it, and that you leave a comment if you want to start a discussion with somebody else in the comment section. I'll probably read it, but I can't get to all of them. So that's kind of where I'm at, just so you guys know on that. But if you're not subscribed, do, and each week you'll find more reviews like this here. I'll talk to you later.